to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. So, Reed, last week we talked in depth about what we would change in the recruiting sessions, training and development process for Air Force officers. And this week we want to get into now that you've received your commission, what do we do with you then? How does the Air Force help you to continue to develop into what is ultimately the purpose of your commission, right? Which is to be a commander, especially of a joint force, right? So that's where we want to focus our conversation today around some of those things that we feel will be best for the development of our officers. We got into some of those things last week, such as the elimination of the bachelor's degree. Maybe that is something that needs to happen at another point in your development as an officer. But those are the things that we want to discuss today is how do we produce officers who fall into that three C's model of character, competence, and connection and develop that over the course of their career. Precisely, because just like the Cheshire Cat in Alice in the Looking Glass, if you don't have a destination that you're trying to achieve, then it doesn't really matter what path you take. Right. We kind of described the entryway to the path last week, so now we need to provide what that picture looks like of where we're trying to go with this right? and how you're utilized and describe how we're going to get there. And thankfully, we've already done quite a bit on how the Air Force develops officers especially in our episode 70, where Colin, you interviewed Colonel Thaden. He went in some pretty good detail about how that currently is done. Yeah. And you know, that's pretty normal for how we like to structure our episodes is that we want to talk about the current situation, provide some official guidance on what the policy is, that sort of thing. Interestingly enough, I don't know about you, I couldn't find anything in an AFI or Air Force manual that says this is officer development. But even without that, we have a pretty good idea of who are the different offices or organizations within the Department of the Air Force that are responsible for the development of the Air Force officer. Colonel Thaden, he was in charge of one of those offices there at Headquarters Air Force, half A1H. That's the talent management and and innovation cell. And he highlighted in that interview a number of different things that his office was responsible for. The changes that are coming in the officer evaluation system that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And we just saw you know, some additional results of that, right? You know, the new ALQs, which uh, we've been discussing. And they also produced the framework for OIRSD, the Officer Instructor and Recruiting Special Duty. So A1H is one of those centers, one of those offices within the Air Force that provides a lot of the policy and strategy for the development of officers over the course of their career. Yeah, exactly. Including the recent changes to the line of the Air Force promotion categories, which we've described in previous episodes, as well as talent marketplace, which is the structure and system that is used to assign individuals to the appropriate jobs throughout the service. That all happened and kind of took shape there at at half A1H. Big important thing to know about HAF is they own the policy and strategy, and then AFPC, an organization that we're going to talk about in depth here in a minute, they kind of own the execution side of that, the Air Force Personnel Center. Each staff, A staff, is kind of responsible for their own career field. So I'm a 14N intelligence officer, and I'm owned by the A26, which is intelligence and cyber. Also, the career field managers will produce something for many career fields called the CFETP, the Career Field Education and Training Plan. For the intelligence field, we actually got rid of our CFETP and we actually have a talent management framework. But bottom line, half is going to set kind of that vision of in order to develop you in the form that we need, here's some guidance. Yeah. Yeah. So it shows that A1H is not the only ones who have a hand in this. 
you know, half in general, the different A staffs, they certainly play a role in the development of officers. You mentioned AFPC, Air Force Personnel Center. That's where these policies and that strategy actually gets put into practice. They own the assignments process, for example, and are having these regular conversations about individual people. Are we developing them into the kind of officer that the Air Force needs? Exactly. And we've got an interview that we'll publish here coming up where I talk to somebody who currently works at AFPC, and we go into a little bit of detail on that. And it's definitely something, Colin, that you and I should probably get more in depth. Yeah into in the future. So noted, we'll put a pin in that one. But for most of your career, AFPC is going to be that front door that you will be interacting with. They are the people who are going to send you an email that says, congratulations, you've gotten an assignment. And then you will immediately dive into the nethers right. of the Air Force system. Stop to try everything. To figure out, yes, <laughs> Nothing exactly. Nothing is more important than this. Right Where now. have they sent me? You know, like that's the kind of thing that AFPC is going to do, but they're also going to hold the promotion boards. They're going to get guidance from half on how that's supposed to go, but they're the people that are organizing, receiving all the paperwork, training the board members, that sort of thing. So that's going to be kind of the front end that you will interact with over, you know, during your career. Yeah. And just as a, an important side note, AFPC is geared toward active duty, but on the Guard and Reserve side, there is the Air Reserve Personnel Center that does essentially the same things. They help you to decide duty locations if you want to make a switch. They hold the promotion boards. They do all retention and separation kind of stuff. And so follows very similarly to what AFPC is doing for the active duty. Another thing we haven't talked about that is a key component in the development of officers is Air University. Air University is right now headquartered at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. That is where the headquarters for Air Force ROTC and Junior ROTC is, as well as Officer Training School is held there. Yep. But it also puts on all the levels of officer professional military education. And enlisted, by the way. Yep, exactly. And that's also done at Gunter Annex, uh -huh. which used to be an Air Force base, which is you know, just a few miles away. That's where a lot of that happens. But there's also some enlisted over at Maxwell proper. Bottom line. SOS, ACSC, Air War College, that is all run, owned, and operated out of Air University. Yeah, and it was interesting to look at the Air University page as we were preparing for this episode. I mean, I kind of knew this in the back of my mind, but here now it's at the forefront that officer development isn't just those three schools or colleges. It's not just SOS, ACSC, and Air War College, but there's some other things that go into the development of the officer and some other opportunities that we can pursue over the course of a career, such as spending some time at the LeMay Center for Doctrine and Development and Education, the School for Advanced Air and Space Studies, being an Air Force Fellow, and maybe even working at the PACE, which is the Profession of Arms Center of Excellence. Lots of different things roll up into this broad construct known as Air University. Yeah. And Colin, that's not even the half of it. There, there are a lot of organizations and schools and centers of excellence and things that happen there. When I was assigned there, it definitely opened my eyes to just how, you know, you'd meet another officer and you're like, oh, where do you work? And they'll mention some organization you've never even heard of. Yeah. And then you find out that there's dozens of highly dedicated professionals trying to focus their time and energy into developing and growing officers. And that's something we want to own out front is there is a lot and we don't want for our audience to get the sense that we don't think the Air Force is developing officers. We think they are. Yeah. We don't feel neglected in any way, but as is the MO of an Air Force officer, we want to pursue excellence. We think that there are some things that we can look at to make it just that much better. And so that's kind of the genesis of our discussion today. Yeah, absolutely. The development of Air Force officers has been going on for a long time, and clearly that process has been working pretty well. I mean, our officers are dedicated, capable, very much able to bring the fight to the enemy, and you know, it's one of the reasons why we have the greatest Air Force in the world. But as we've talked previously, that's not guaranteed, right? There are some things that, that are coming our way that are part of the national defense strategy, we got into it in General Brown's Accelerate, Change, or Lose. There are some things afoot that require a different approach to development of our officers, and that's where we want to focus our attention today. 
And interestingly enough, read just a few weeks ago, the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, as well as the service senior enlisted advisors, the eight highest ranking enlisted members of the military, they released a formal statement on the need to reform enlisted development. And their justification was exactly that, that we are returning to great power competition. And the recognition of that is that we can't be content with the current way of doing things. We can't just accept the status quo. But if we want to really excel in that type of environment, I mean, they say in there that the return of great power competition adds further complexity to the current security environment that accelerates the need for agile, flexible, and adaptable warfighters who are capable of guiding our military strategy towards a high-end fight. Again, Reed, that sounds very much like what we discussed previously when we reviewed General Brown's Accelerate, Change, or Lose paper. Yes. And... As a result, we think that this is something that our audience should be paying attention to. Yes, we recognize that many of you are officers or prospective officers and are not thinking in depth about enlisted PME copy. But the ties between General Brown's paper, the NDS, and the overall movement of the OES into changing and elevating our evaluation and development of personnel This is going to be part of that. There's also something I really loved in there, Colin, and I know you noted this. There's a number of references to character, competence, and commitment, which sounded a whole lot like our 3C model of character, competence, and connection all leading up to command. Yeah. I mean, I'm super excited about what the senior enlisted advisors have put out there. I think it's great to see that kind of language being used and discussed at the highest levels. To me, it signals that we're not entirely off the mark with what we're proposing. And it also, I think that it is more evidence that shows that change is needed, that change is coming, and that we all need to get on board in order to accelerate that change. We need it faster. We need it to be here. Yes. So in that spirit of throwing everything at the wall and brainstorming thinking big thoughts and trying everything out. Let's get back to, you know, some of the more explosive things we talked about last week. You know, one of the things we think that should change is drastically altering the way we commission our officers. Yeah. That ROTC would basically not exist anymore. We would repurpose the Air Force Academy and officer training school into a single commissioning source and officers would all be selected among the enlisted and that a bachelor's degree would not be a requirement for you to pin on those bars. Yeah. And let's emphasize that point that all officers would be selected from among the enlisted. What that means is that the development of the officer would begin with their enlisted experience and that PME that we were just talking about. Right. And from my perspective, that is looking really good is that they're wanting to develop enlisted leaders. Well, that's just going to feed the development of the future officer who is then going to be a leader of those enlisted leaders. And maybe here's a good opportunity for us to discuss, read some other ideas around that, which is that not all the enlisted want to be leaders. Some of them want to stay tactical and technical, and maybe there needs to be some additional enlisted PME that's focused on the technical side of things as opposed to just the leadership development. I don't know. What do you think there? So this is definitely shaped by the lens of the airmen that I lead and I'm surrounded by. Right. Most of the airmen in the intelligence career fields, the 1N career fields, are incredibly intelligent and are doing very hard things. Yeah. It would not be uncommon at all for it to take six to eight years and maybe even more for them to fully become fully qualified in what we're asking of them. That's a long time. Yeah. It's really hard. Some of this stuff, you know, I would expect them to have a pretty solid background in physics, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and maybe even some other, you know, very technical things. And yet by the time they get to be competent, it's now time per the little brown book for them to start becoming admin and supervising only. And that's a real frustration, especially in the intelligence career fields. And so, yeah, I remember Chief Wright, he came to Maxwell when I was at OTS and gave 
a little session. And one of the things he mentioned that, you know, maybe we ought to think about dividing the enlisted force more like the Marines do, where they have a leadership within the Marines, you know, like yeah. the master sergeant types, the sergeant majors, you know, the folks that are kind of going to be leading enlisted. But then you have the gunny types, which are the technical experts. They're not warrant officers because they don't get a commission, but they're that kind of focus on the tactical expertise. I like that idea. I think there's some merit to that. So yeah, I'm not totally certain how that looks, but I definitely think that's something that we should really think about is who's going to do the job. Yes, we need leaders and we need leaders at all levels. But at the end of the day, someone's got to put pen to paper. Someone's got to put, you know, a boot on the ground and do the job. Yeah. And Colin, something we've talked a lot about, right? We've talked a lot about we need to reemphasize character and connection and the propensity and ability to command. But we don't want to throw out the competence with that. Right. And that's something that I think you and I have recognized as we go through this. One of the benefits of our current system, with all its flaws, is that we are very competent. Yeah. And I'm really okay with that. I really want us to be very good. Yep. Let's just not compromise that competence in our desire to also achieve character and connection and propensity for command. Yeah, and let's also not compromise the need for that competence within the enlisted corps as we develop them as leaders. Yes, we want them to be leaders and we want to identify those who have the potential for even higher levels of leadership by then selecting those people, sending them to this single commissioning source that is housed at the Air Force Academy to go through a long training program that shifts their mindset away from the tactical into the more operational and strategic that's necessary to be an effective officer and an effective leader of the enlisted and effective commander, right? That's what we want. Yeah. That's what the development of the officer corps needs to look like. Yes. And so I think that's a good point for us to kind of discuss this bachelor's degree requirement thing. Yeah. As it stands right now, this was something that would often come up at OTS with the students, especially the prior enlisted members. They would look me in the face and say, sir, why do I need a college degree to do this? And you made a face. I made the same face. I couldn't answer that question. Yeah. Yes. My education and background in academia was extremely valuable to me. I just cannot connect deliberate leadership development to the achievement of a bachelor's degree, not at the CGO level. I do think ultimately we're going to have to have that level of education, especially as you start to move into those FGO ranks. You're going to start interacting with people across the whole of government, with foreign nationals, and the challenges that you are going to ask to be leading people through are going to become increasingly complex. I don't know that college will make you a better leader, but I do think it's going to give you, I do think college challenges you as a problem solver, as a learner, yeah. and will broaden your educational background enough that you'll be able to more appropriately address those challenges. You know, I came in, Colin, with a master's degree in cell biology, and that has benefited me from day one. Yeah. And we talked about that, right? We're going to pay you. If you come in with education, that's a value. We're going to pay you for that. But I don't know that it was a requirement to lead airmen, especially at the CGO level. Now that I'm starting to move into those FGO ranks, everything is getting harder and I'm relying more and more on those skills I developed there, but just not to lead airmen. So, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, you're exactly right that the purpose of getting a bachelor's degree is not so that you can be a leader among leaders. That's not what a bachelor's is for. You know, members of the audience, you should not pursue a bachelor's thinking that it's going to make you a leader among leaders. It's just not the case. However, the purpose of a bachelor's degree is to help you learn how to learn, to see a problem set and work through it, conduct research, ask questions, all these skills that are 100% necessary for your success as a leader of leaders. Totally agree. Totally agree. So what does the landscape look like? If we, I mean, getting rid of ROTC, changing OTS, not making an academy education, what does it look like? You know, what does the landscape look like now that we've, you know, scorched earth the whole thing? Right now, in the vision that we've kind of been thinking of, all the service academies, and we think this needs to apply across the DOD. I don't know that you can just do this to one service. I think it, it's going to be a bigger cultural change. 
all the service academies would still be degree granting institutions. Yeah. That's important because education is still going to matter. Yeah. We're going to need an accredited vehicle to verify curriculum, to give college credit for education and training and things of that nature. So we have to have some structure that is recognized and able to give degrees, but that's kind of what it's going to be. It's going to be that overall structural body. And maybe there is some way that, you know, we send people for two years to finish their degree and they get it from the Air Force Academy. You know, we're open to those ideas, but that's not as important as what those service academies become. They become the spiritual home mm -hmm. of training and education for their officer corps. So OTS would move there, as would, you know, the primary developmental education, intermediate developmental education, and senior development education. All of those would be moved to this core center of the intellectual and educational and training development for their officers. Yeah, and that's not too far off from at least how the Air Force operates right now. Air University is, as it currently stands, the spiritual home for officer development. We just highlighted all the things that happen there, but we are proposing that that would happen at the Air Force Academy. And we've highlighted why we think it should be there over, over Maxwell. And so the entirety of officer development on the PME side of things would happen there. You have already gone through basic military training at Lackland or wherever you needed to complete that. You have served for at least 18 months as an enlisted airman, learning your trade, getting good at your job, showing that you have the ability in demonstrating your competence, as well as your character and connection with other people. But then you get selected, you're identified as someone of potential by the command structure sent to the Air Force Academy to go through a long commissioning preparation program, at least six months mandatory in residence, and that then prepares you to receive your commission. But that's not the only time that you spend there. Exactly. Eventually you come back, just like you do right now, you go back to Maxwell again to go to SOS or whatever your primary developmental education is going to be. And we think that that should be a long course as well. Exactly. Yep. And that idea of coming back regularly to the spiritual home of all development, education and training for officers will have the effect, at least our intended effect, of creating that spiritual home. You will begin to identify with the people, with the ideas, with the place, and all those things provide tradition, they provide connection, they provide a sense of becoming part of this tribe. And that's a really important aspect of all this. And we think that having things be longer than just a few weeks you know, here and there spent in PME, yeah, ACSC and Air War College are much longer than SOS. But each one of those is the opportunity for you to truly reconnect with your character as an Air Force officer, to connect with other people, build your connection that way, and increase your competence as an officer, as a leader of leaders, as a leader of the enlisted corps. Yeah, because right now, and let's just own it, Colin, SOS is seen as a distraction. It is seen as, oh, garbage, I can't do my job. I have to go to this crappy training at Maxwell for five to six weeks. It's viewed as a vacation for those that are, you know, I remember at the time when I went to SOS, I was on night shift in Hawaii. So I was really excited to stop being a shift worker yep. and take a few minutes and kind of focus on myself and my own development. But for too many officers who attend SOS right now, it is seen as a distraction from their mission. And Colin, we've talked about how we can change that by you know our mentality and never leaving a room where people talk like that and, and saying, hey, that's on us. Yeah, Reed, don't talk like that. <laughs> but I'm observing the state of being right now. Yeah. And I think if you make it mandatory in residence, six months, you won't pin on 03 until you go to this course. I think it would change people's tone. I think it would change the way people think about this course. Additionally, right now in our proposal, not all of these people are going to have bachelor's degrees. So we right. would make this six months worth their time uh, and go towards college credit. 
you know, if we actually cared about education, let's show how much we care. Yeah. That's kind of the way we're thinking about this. And similar things apply to ACSC and Air War College. They're a year long now in residence, but the correspondence courses are not. I was able to accomplish the correspondence course ACSC in less than five months. I'm not sure I'm a fan of that. Yes, it was nice to be able to knock it out quickly, but I also didn't feel that it was a serious educational experience. It was just another box that you had to check. It was. And frankly, if I want to go in residence, I have to complete the correspondence course ahead of time anyway, which is absurd. If you do one, it should count yep. and it should be enough. And the one way we could do that is by making all of the courses facilitated. What does that mean? Right now, ACSC and Air War College, by correspondence, are a mix of teacher-led facilitated courses where there's a strict timeline, specific deadlines, you have to log in at certain times, that sort of thing, and then a self-paced course. I understand the reason for having the flexibility of a self-paced course, but... If we actually cared about it, and if it was of value, then we would take time out of the duty day. Yeah. Imagine if half of your duty day, three days a week, was allocated for attending these courses. Then maybe it would demonstrate value, right? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't be doing this PME by correspondence all the time, but there would be specific points in time over the course of your development as an officer where that is the expectation that you will spend official duty time working on your PDE, on your IDE, on your SDE for your 03, your 05, your 06 selection. And you would have to have those done in order to be selected for promotion. Yeah, it makes sense to me that we should not only award college credit, but we should make it part of your official duty to attain that level of development in order to receive the promotion that allows you to continue to grow and develop your ability to serve as an officer, increase your competence, connection, character, and your propensity for command. Yeah, because right now, unfortunately, they're just seen as things you have to accomplish, and it doesn't feel like we actually value those experiences because it's on your own time, it's at your own pace, but you better have it done before your 05 board. You know, that's kind of how it feels. And only the select few, the blessed, lucky, who get to go in residence, uh, you know, what, 15%, maybe less? Yeah. So if it matters, show. Show me it matters by measuring, right? Remember, Colin, we measure what we care about and what we yep. care about ends up getting measured. And I think we could do that with, you know, part of our OES and part of this developmental plan in general. Yeah. And so this, again, goes back to the conversation around the bachelor's degree. That's kind of what initiated all this. It also includes the master's degree. There should be credit given towards a master's by doing IDE and SDE because you're an 04 at that point, right? And it's required for you to have a bachelor's in order to be an 04. Yeah. So we're not throwing out education. No, we still see the value of continued and higher education over the course of career. It is definitely part of the development of an effective officer. But what we are recommending here is that we shift the place and the context of where that bachelor's degree gets earned when it's required. Same thing for the master's degree and move it to a place where it's more appropriate, which is like we were saying at higher levels of responsibility where you need that more finely tuned skill around asking questions, doing research, solving problems, and connecting to bigger ideas outside of the Air Force. Yeah, I'm trying to get away from the online only MBA that somebody did, you know, on nights and weekends just so that they can get ahead. Yeah, that's not education to me. That's just I don't even know what I want to call it. Practice bureaucracy. I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure. And I'm not denigrating people who do that at all because that's the system we're in and that's the reaction they've had to have in order to stay competitive. I want to get away from a place where that's seen as a viable solution for them. I want to get back to a place where education actually matters. And that's what we're talking about. And Colin, you know, part of that is we have proposed getting away from this idea that there are only certain things officers do when it comes to career fields yeah. and removing those restrictions. And so why don't we, you know, talk a little bit more about that? What are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, 
you said at the time when introducing this idea that we need to focus on officers having only like one track. There's no more debate around our officers leaders or are they technicians or tacticians? Are we focused on the leadership side or are we focused on your career field? And we suggested, you suggested that there should be no debate. There's only one track, which is command, which is leadership, right? And so removing that restriction enables for officers then to focus on that one command track. And let's remember that what we're trying to do here is the ultimate purpose of the commission is to become that commander, especially at the joint force level. And so I want to bring up here again that the document that the uh, service senior enlisted advisors put out, they want the enlisted to be leaders too. And I agree with that. I think that they should be leaders. But as we discussed, they also need to be focused on the technical aspects of carrying out the Air Force mission. But in their document, even when they're talking all about leadership, never once did they make any mention of the enlisted taking command, right? Absolutely, we want our enlisted to have the high moral and ethical character, the extreme competence that is required by their profession, and the ability to connect deeply with the people around them. Through this, they earn our trust just like we earn their trust. That is what the eventually leads to special trust and confidence of the commission, right? We want our enlisted to be able to lead like that among airmen of all types and ranks, even at the highest levels of joint or multinational forces, right? We want our enlisted to be able to do that, but never under any circumstance should the enlisted be given the authority of command. It is not their responsibility. That belongs solely to the commissioned officer who has the actual special trust and confidence of that commission and has been deliberately developed for command. And so that then is the question. How do we do that? How do we develop that? And unfortunately, Colin, we are two non-commanders, right? right. <laughs> we, uh, now, we have been flight commanders, which I do feel was a very valuable experience yeah. as you and I have developed, but that's it. You know, that's as far as we've gotten. Yeah, here we are 10 years into our service as officers, and you and I have never been commanders where we've held G-series orders, been responsible for NJP, non-judicial punishment, and, and the things that kind of belong to the responsibility of command. And if we learned anything, Colin, during our time as flight commanders in a sessions trainings, it was how important reps are to getting good at that. Yeah. There are still things that are just so hard, like giving feedback to that middle of the road, you know, cadet who's not great, but they're not bad. They're just fine. And they want to develop into being great. They want to stay out of the not good category. That's still hard. And I did it a lot. Yeah. Then I look at some of my peers who have been flight commanders once or maybe not at all. They are asking me these questions. How do you do that? I'm like, well, you know, it's really hard. And But I've at least had some reps. I've at least seen that. And this idea is not new, right? The whole idea of Top Gun, a fighter weapon school, is exposing people to pressures and situations so that when they're in it for realsies, they don't die. It's the same thing with command. You need reps. And so that's one thing that we think we need to do is kind of push some of these responsibilities on folks a little bit earlier, a little bit sooner. And if the entire structure is focused on only developing command, yes, you need some competence at some skills in order to lead effectively. But if it's all around that idea of being a commander, we think you're going to get some more reps sooner, which will help develop you into a better leader. So some more things, right? How does PME develop us into that place? You have to study your profession around the idea of being a commander. Again, character, competence, and connection. Character. Let's really dig into that. Let's ask ourselves hard questions. Let's, you know, do right now, like the DISCA studies and the, you know, ENTJ, you know, what right. are the, you know these uh, character profiles. Myers-Briggs kind of stuff. Yeah, we do that. But for an hour and a half on one random Tuesday, what if you actually like read some books about that? Let's get your Myers-Briggs 
tetragram and see who you are. And then let's assign you some biographical novels of people who fall into those things. You know, let's really dig into this type of thing. Competence. Yes, I need you to be competent at a skill. You need to be able to connect to the people you're leading. So you need to be able to understand what they're doing. Let's dig into that. The army right now, they have a captain's course mm -hmm. for all of their O3s. It's six months long. And it's like this combined technical career field focused, but also leadership studies thing. It's six months. Everybody goes in residence. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about something at that level. PME focus on developing you into that potential future commander. And then connection, you and I talked last week, Colin, you can do almost anything for 10 days to eight weeks. Yeah. You can ignore those interpersonal challenges. You can frankly never talk to these people again, and it's not going to hurt you. We can't do that. We need you to have a network of talented peers that you're connected to meaningfully so that you can leverage those experiences. Colin, you and I have deployed multiple times. We have those connections yep. because you were in it with those folks and we still leverage those experiences. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. And let's be honest, like I was able to develop some of those relationships at SOS because of the people that I was surrounded by. Many of them had the mentality that going in that you described that this is a distraction. It's keeping me from developing the skills necessary to be a competent leader and that kind of thing. But at the same time, they were open and honest about it. They engaged in the intellectual study and debate around officership, and they were willing to share what it was that they were doing in their career field. They were interested in learning about what others were doing in theirs. And so through that, we not only all increased our character and our competence, but our connection as officers. So it is possible, but what we're proposing is that PME across the course of a career that it does that in a more concentrated and longer time frame, so that we can get that much more benefit out of it. Exactly. So that it's not seen as a distraction from my real job that no, this is the purpose for which you were brought into the world <laughs> as an officer. Right. Right. And. You know, along with this, Colin, we've proposed a bunch of things and, and there's kind of some I don't know, you know, random cats and dogs that kind of need to get talked about here a little bit. So, you know, we've already brought up the officer evaluation system, you know, how that needs to be tweaked to be that bridge between these discrete PME experiences. Yeah. You know, you and I both have experienced significant benefits from our time as instructors. You know, do we want to work that in as a mandatory tour? for promotion 06 or 07. I think there's some ways in which we could see that being really beneficial. If the job of a leader is to develop more leaders, what better place to get experience doing that than in the place where we commission our future leaders? Yeah. So there's other things. The company grade officer council, it could be so good. Right now it's seen as something that people who have time get to do. It's another distraction. It's an, yeah. So there's so many things that we could talk about that we'd have to reevaluate in this idea and call on something very briefly. I know we're not going to spend too much time in this, but right now with the, you know, retirement has to happen at 20 years, I think with blended retirement system coming in and this idea of more flexibility, people not staying in as long, potentially, I think the Air Force in 10 years is going to be very different than it is now. And I think there'll be more propensity for people to, once they recognize they're not on a command track, to take their talents and go somewhere else. And so all of this stuff is leading to, you know, there's some real gray fuzziness here in our plan as well. And we recognize some weaknesses there. So audience, we want to hear from you. You know, what are some things that you think, big thoughts, big ideas, what could officer development look like? Colin, we've talked about Hey, maybe you spend three years as a second lieutenant, yeah. three years as a first lieutenant, so that you don't spend so long as a captain. And that increases the value, the perceived value and talent, skills, and abilities of a second lieutenant and a first lieutenant. Because right now, you're not even a real person until you're a captain. I mean, who are we right. kidding, right? So, yeah, so much we could talk about there. And I know, you know, we've been going on for a little bit. Colin, before we go too much further, we need to talk about this idea that folks are going to be transitioning out. Because like I mentioned, with getting rid of the 20-year retirement requirement and the new blended retirement system, people are going to leave sooner. 
And so we aren't doing a good job talking about that now. So what does that have to look like in the future? You know, where we start talking about transition more often. Yeah. So this is the thing that I wanted to make sure we touched on as we discuss the process and overall arc of officer development. Yes, the purpose of officer development is to produce commanders, especially at the joint force level. And that has to come through repetition. You have to get the exposure to command through PME and through the officer evaluation system and actually being a commander, you know, you need to do that. But to your point, the reality is that not everybody is going to be a joint force commander. And you know what, that's okay, right? Not everybody is meant for that. But with that comes the recognition that eventually people are going to have to take off the uniform and they should be prepared for whatever is going to come next, because that's still part of the developmental process. You know what? Even the joint force commander that we've been talking about developing is also going to have to take the uniform off and go do something else. Yeah. Right. Even after 30 years of commission service, leading at the highest level, at some point, someone's going to stamp a DD-214 for them and hand it to them and say, thank you very much. Like <laughs> It's going to happen. Yeah. So regardless of what the end state of your career is, you're going to take the uniform off and you need to be prepared for it. And the way that it occurs right now is through much fear and trepidation because it's so unknown to the vast majority of officers because the majority of their professional career has been spent in the military and they don't have a connection, they don't have an understanding of what things look like on the outside or what they're going to be doing. And there are transition services like TAP, the Transition Assistance Program. There are things that will allow officers to spend some time in industry like EWI or UE, the Employment with Industry kind of fellowship, if you will. But TAP is so brief and, and UE is so rare in the officer experience, most of us don't get to go do that, that that becomes then the source of that fear and trepidation. And so let's flip that on its head and find ways to expose our officers to the things that are going to be happening after their career more frequently. And the ideas that I recommend for doing that, number one is to make the barrier between active duty, guard and reserve far more permeable. And what do I mean by that? Make it much easier for people for officers to switch from full-time active service to part-time. Let them keep wearing the uniform, but also go do some things where they don't wear the uniform. Go work in corporate America or nonprofit organizations or go do school at a civilian institution or whatever it might be that provides that exposure, that experience outside of the Air Force for a certain amount of time. And if they so choose, Make it easier for the guard or reservist who's been doing the part-time thing to come back on and do full-time active service again. Now, I don't know exactly what all that is going to look like from a policy standpoint, but strategically, it makes sense in my mind that you would provide those kinds of options. Yeah. And there's so many benefits that could come from this, right? We've talked about the civ mill gap, right? The gap between protectors and the people we protect and not understanding each other and talking past each other, even though we have the similar goals. I think that would close in this situation, right? It would minimize that a little bit. It would increase our connection with the industries that we rely on for our weapons and our systems and our capabilities. And, you know, it could even alleviate some of these binge and purge experiences we have with manpower. Yeah. You know, right now we are bloated. We have too many people. And so and why is that? Because COVID, right? But COVID is not preventing people from succeeding in the corporate world. It's because they don't know what's out there. Exactly. They are afraid of not being able to get a job because of the economic environment. But if they knew how they could take what they've learned as officers and apply it in the civilian world because they had already done it before, then that fear around the transition just completely disappears. Yeah. I mean, it would be a complete culture shift. It would be very different. And Colin, I think that's kind of where we're going to kind of leave it. We need a culture shift. We need to change the way we think about this problem set. 
or else, as General Brown has outlined, we are going to lose. And so those are some of the myriad of ideas Colin, you and I have shared over, you know, drinks and texts and conversations over the years. Uh, we would love to hear what you guys think. What are some of the thoughts that you are having? What are the things that you and your peers are discussing that would completely revamp the way we think about this problem? Because Colin, you and I do not have this right. <laughs> we, <laughs> we do not have this figured out. And this is just our thoughts and perspectives, but we want to hear from you. We love listening to you, our audience, and your interactions with us. Thank you for the emails, for the messages on Instagram and Facebook and all the other places that you interact with us. We really appreciate that. And before we wrap it up, Colin, you want to give us a little forecast of an episode we have coming up. Yeah. When we set out to do this series, we had thought that we were going to end it right there, that we had talked about everything that we needed to with respect to what it means to be an officer, how they should be evaluated, the recruiting, sessions process, the development. We thought that that was going to be it. However, very recently, I did an interview with a close friend of mine, colleague, Captain Jordan Woods, who I worked with in Air Force ROTC at Detachment 855. And through that interview, it became clear to me that his experience encapsulates everything that we have discussed over the last month or so to include that special trust and confidence that comes from character, competence, connection, the very high potential for command and success in an Air Force career, but also preparation for the transition. It's all in this interview. And so I felt that this would be a fantastic capstone to all of the things that we'd been discussing. And to put another voice on all of these things that we've covered, and do so from a perspective that I think is really going to hit home for very many of our officers and potential officers who have that desire to serve, who want to succeed, but recognize that there are other things that they need to take into account and be aware of. So super excited to bring this interview to all of you, and that will be the conclusion of this series on officership, how to develop it, and it will conclude this series on what it means to be an officer. Yeah, and we really appreciate all of you indulging Colin and I on our tirades. <laughs> uh, this has been really fun for us, but we also recognize that a lot of you are here to hear from other people as well, and we will have a bunch more interviews coming up in the next few weeks. So with that, that will conclude this week's episode of Commission Net.